Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends following online. It is my infinite pleasure to welcome you all to this book launch for the Third Siege of Malta by Manuel Delia, published by Mitzi Books. Manuel needs no introduction since we have been following his blog for four years now. Most of us remember reading his very first blog post that was reproduced on Daphne Caruana Galizia's running commentary on the 6th June 2017. We all sat up and listened, for we loved this new voice from the very beginning. This is not the first book either, for together with Carlo Bonini and John Sweeney, Manuel has written the bestseller Murder on the Malta Express, also published by Mitzi Books, which won the National Book Prize last December. Congratulations. Indeed, this launch tonight is a celebration of four years of incidental blogging that quickly transformed itself into intentional hard-hitting journalism and activism on the 16th October 2017. This book is an anthology of blog posts from manueldelia.com and columns for the Sunday Times of Malta written in the past four years. We all remember what we were doing on that day that has gone down in infamy. While we were feverishly refreshing Daphne's website, hoping against hope that her assassination was but a bad dream, Manuel was already putting into words what many of us couldn't express. I remember thinking on that day, but how can he find the words? And so eloquently. After having read again most of his 4,000 blog posts and articles to edit this book, his pieces on Daphne Caruana Galizia remain the most poetic, the most heart-wrenching, and the most insightful of them all. And I think you all agree with me. <laughs> Almost immediately, Manuel left his full-time job to take up writing full-time. For as he told me during our first conversations about the book, he felt compelled to chronicle what we are witnessing in full-time, in real time. As he himself says in the preface, quote, the book is a selection of blog posts published on truthbetoldmanueldalia.com since its inception on 6 June 2017. These were the years of Daphne Caruana Galizia's passion and execution, and the struggle of a minority in Malta who fought and continue to fight for justice for her, for her family, and for her country. Daphne was assassinated by a car bomb outside her home on the 16th October 2017. That event ended her life. It also transformed the lives of many, my own included." Unquote. Manuel is the first one to tell you, and indeed he told us himself on the 13th September 2017, this blog post will be read out later, that he is no Daphne. He does not presume to be another Daphne. There was and is only one of her. But on that day in October, he felt he had to step up. In the foreword of this book we're launching tonight, Judge Emeritus Giovanni Bonello writes, quote, Manuel Delia is one of the few in Malta who has understood the real mission of the press, not to demean itself at the feet of the emperor, but to tell the crowds with deficits instead of brains that the emperor actually has no clothes at all. Not only is he naked, he's ugly, filthy, and radiates a sickening stench of death and corruption. <laughs> the dauntless journalist who last did that got what the emperor believed she deserved. She was blown up and the tatters of her flesh have all the markings of a state-curated assassination that very few seem, seem eager to solve. We wonder why. So, and this is me. 
It is proper and fitting to give Daphne Caruana Galizia her rightful place this evening. In fact, while writing the name of the book in the opening paragraph of this address, and it happened a lot during while I was writing this speech, I actually wrote Great Siege Square instead of the Third Siege of Malta everywhere since that location has become the embodiment of Daphne's courage. For we instinctively understood that our heroine walked in our midst, and thus she deserves to be included in the pantheon of heroes from history. The Great Sea Square is also the locus of our ongoing battle to obtain justice for Daphne and her stories. It has become our second home, a home that we have missed for the past year or so, even though we still make it a point to go, to, to go check on the memorial every time we happen to be in Valletta, right, Anne? We have missed each other, but here we are again tonight. You will all agree with me when I say that this evening feels somewhat like a vigil. Since we couldn't be here this square, at the square tonight, we chose this location instead. However, this is not a random location. For as we know, this place is another battleground. You can just see the battle scars just beyond the gate. Actually, Claude, we thank, sorry, I missed a bit. We thank the chef patron, Claude Camilleri, for being such a good friend and supporter of this ongoing fight for the soul of our country. Actually, Claude is an activist in his own right, who uses food as protest. In fact, and let's see who remembers, Daphne herself had highlighted a particular pizza Claude had named. Who can remember and who's this honor? Acapulco. So, you know, it was FKK Acapulco. What about the labels of his homegrown beer? Are you having any beer tonight? Did you read the labels closely? What's the name of his beer? Tal Pastas. Then he'll tell you himself why. It's been a year since we have met to remember Daphne's ultimate sacrifice. But we have never stopped fighting and protesting. For we are a community of activists, each with a unique role how we protest the skilling of one of us, of a journalist who held authority to account and paid with her life. Little by little, we too had to step up because sitting on the fence was no longer an option. Yes, remembering is important, but remembrance is not enough. For remembrance only relegates Daphne's killing to history. We must also continue to fight with every means at our disposal for truth and justice for her, for her stories, because keeping things in the present makes them immediate and urgent. So yes, we all had to step up. Some of us stand up in front of the nation with our speeches. Some of us write Facebook posts or comments, going to war with the trolls and delves that infest our social media platforms and traditional media comments boards daily. Some of us write poetry, paint pictures, draw cartoons, brew beers, name pizzas, place a photo of Daphne on our balconies and replace it when it fades. Others place candles and flowers at the memorial in Great Sea Square and with Nia. Others write columns and articles, a handful of investigative journalists worthy of the name, some of whom are present here tonight, take unimaginable risks by digging deep in the filth and corruption of this country. Others are politicians who refuse to toe the line and stand for what is right, not for what is popular. But we wouldn't be able to do all this if we didn't have the example of the family of Daphne Caruana Galizia, who keep who keep showing us the way how to fight this tyranny with grace and intelligence, who keep teaching invaluable lessons of responsible citizenship 
to an ungrateful country. We can never, ever thank you enough. Allow me to salute two of the bravest people we know, who have not been able to join us for some time, but whose presence is always felt and missed. Daphne's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Vella, Michael and Rose. Thank you for your grace under pressure and for the support you give us all. Thank you so much. So when people admire us for stepping up, we're not doing anything special. We're doing our duty. We only stepped up because they have done it all before us. When Manuel told me that he's planning another book, I thought it was just a conversation piece, you know, to make conversation over coffee or something. So I must have surely made some noises like, good for you, Mela, so what, Amel, prosit. <laughs> Check. <laughs> then I'm sure he must have some, said something like, and I want you to help me put it together. And I remember saying distinctly, Mela, label alp colla. <laughs> but then afterwards I said to myself, tanch te palura ta. Do we even know what that entails, editing an anthology, when all I had edited before is assignment, maybe an essay, a thesis, an article? But I am a swim, not sink sort of person. So I decided to paddle furiously. Seriously, though, haven't we all challenged our comfort zones these past four years? This is one of them. Of course, it did help that I have what Sheldon Cooper describes as an eidetic memory without his genius. So it wasn't difficult to find the pieces that I wanted to include. The problem was always what to leave out. Manuel is not a one-trick pony. He can write about nearly everything. Mushek. So it was important to include a good selection of writings that reflect his talent, his talent for the bon mot, his razor-sharp analysis, his flair for chasing a story, but it is one thing finding the pieces. It was another fitting them into a coherent narrative. It's not a cut and paste job, Jafiri. Truth be told, and I had to use this expression today, Moshe, this wasn't difficult since it did help that I have been reading both Daphne's and Manuel's blogs from the very beginning. So when I was looking for the pieces, I had already created a working structure for the, for the collection I envisioned. And they all slotted neatly under each heading without fail. All merit goes to the author, though, for making my job easier. I am no expert on editing other people's work. But Manuel's thought process is linear. He hardly ever repeats himself or contradicts himself. And apart from his superb mastery of the English language, one other thing that really stands out in his writing is the sheer beauty of his logical arguments. So thank you, Manuel, for your trust in me and for making my job easier than I thought. Thank you. I also wanted to include cartoons and illustrations by established and emerging artists because they are the perfect marriage of words and imagery. Even though Manuel can also paint the most striking pictures with a quick drum tap of his keyboard, on his keyboard. In fact, one of the proposals I had put forward but did not make the cut was to have an index of biting turns of phrase, puns, and hilarious descriptions that he comes up with that really made us laugh out loud. But I did not pursue this idea because I wanted to leave it to you to find them in the course of, the, of reading this book. When Manuel and I were mulling over what to call the book, I jokingly said it should be called The Unfinished Works of Manuel de Lilla. We laughed it off, but the second volume of this book that will be launching tonight is already being written daily. The Third Siege of Malta will be the handbook of this era, sort of a dispatches from the trenches. The worst of times and the best of times. The worst of times because much has been taken away from us and is still being taken away from us daily. 
but these are also the best of times because we are, uh, we are the living embodiment of the legacy Daphne left behind. A group of like-minded, and I venture to say bloody-minded individuals who truly be believe that right and wrong are not a popularity contest and that we'd rather be attacked for choosing to be on the right side of history rather than being popular and traitors to our country. In the words of Manuel Delia from a blog post on the 16th October 2017 at 6.16 p.m., quote, if she is silenced, the only voice that counts now is that of the people whom she served and for whom she gave up her time, her energy, and now her life. If only to thank her husband and her children for their sacrifice, go join the candlelit vigil at the Torre in Slima this evening. And since her blog is eerily frozen in a moment a few hours ago when she was still with us, write in the comment space below your appreciation for Daphne Caruana Galizia's work. As she did for 35 years, stand up to be counted, unquote. We will never stop standing up to be counted. For we have the legs for it, and we are not tired. Thank you. Thank you. Now, please put your hands together for two amazing people who will be reading out two important pieces. One from the book we're launching tonight, and the other is a Facebook post that has moved us all when we read it, and still does when it pops up on our Facebook memories. Let's start with the first speaker, then I'll introduce the second speaker later. The first speaker is Winston Psyla, a very good friend of this cause who has been with us from the very beginning. Winston is an indomitable activist who attends every vigil, both when we still could congregate at the square and online and every protest. Winston has also given a couple of speeches at our vigils on every 16th of the month. He will be reading Manuel's blog post, The Problem with Daphne Caruana Galizia, that was published on the 13th September, 2017. Winston, your turn. Good evening. I was once asked to address an event pretty much like this one and I was extremely foolish with opening up with, I am a man of few words. <laughs> Little knowing that there was a resident court jester who threw at me and also of even fewer inches. <laughs> so I ask you tonight to look beyond me and see Manuel Delia. <laughs> Lend him your ears. Hear his booming voice. <laughs> okay. This is Manuel. 13th September, 2017, 12 minutes after midnight. The problem with Daphne Caruana Galizia is that there is only one of her. She has not been too far from the news for the past 30 years. She is, if you think about it, a more long-lasting feature on our scene than Alfred Sant, Lawrence Gonzi, and others who invested their life in the public eye. I will not write her biography. I am not intending to canonize her, or even lionize her. I am not even meaning to defend her. 
but it would be an incomplete analysis of the current political scenario if her presence in it right now is not understood or at least acknowledged. My sincere frustration is that people approach the subject of Daphne Caruana Galizia either normatively or with a utilitarian assessment. Either manner of thinking, in my opinion, is inadequate. Daphne Caruana Galizia is neither good nor bad, nor is she good for the PN or bad for it. The fact that she is right on some things and wrong on others, or that certain of her positions are advantageous for the PN and certain other positions disadvantageous to it, is purely incidental. Incidental to the mere fact that Daphne Caruana Galizia is. That is a complete sentence. She will write what she wants to write and owes no one a justification on how helpful or unhelpful, kind or harsh her writing is. Her targets often complain she is unfair, and sometimes that is entirely justified. She is, but such is life. <laughs> this sounds uncomfortably like a defense of Daphne Caruana Galizia, and a poor one at that. This is because the unfortunate reality is that the person of Daphne Caruana Galizia and the role she occupies in our society are, by consequence of her being the only one doing it, one and the same entity. No one else since the departure of career labor satirist Lino Cassar has stepped into the role of polemicist in our society. And Lino Cassar is a poor comparison because he thought of himself as a protagonist of a political party in whose interest he believed himself to be acting. That is why the Honorable Glenn Beddingfield MP, <laughs> personal advisor to the Prime Minister and author of a Daphne bashing blood, does not count. Daphne Caruana Galizia's antipathy to the Labour Party is not in itself a commitment to the PN, as can now, but far from for the first time in her career, be clearly seen. I'm glad he likes it. <laughs> that, in cockerel language, is here, here. <laughs> Daphne Caruana Galizia would not be charmed by being compared with Lino Cassar, mostly because she has qualities and merits to her writing that Lino Cassar did not have. She is reluctantly acknowledged by everyone as the foremost investigator in the country. Her coverage and energy and her output with no resources or support except her own two feet are often greater than the product of most new newsrooms put together. But even in Daphne Caruana Galizia herself will likely acknowledge that her writing is not limited to cold, factual, impartial front page broadsheet reporting. She is also a polemicist, a provocateur, a critic who revels in the harshness and the colour of her words. Not everyone reading this will be entirely familiar with Lino Cassar's writings. Not everyone reading this will remember him at all. But everyone will be familiar at least with the magazine title Charlie Hebdo. Many went through a Je suis Charlie phase on their Facebook pages when half the writing team was gunned down by terrorists. Even as they tagged the Jesuit Charlie motto to their profile pictures, many were unaware just what Charlie Hebdo habitually writes. If people here complain Daphne Caruana Galizia is not nice, and no, she is not nice and has no ambition to be, Charlie Hebdo is positively inflammatory. Charlie Hebdo's target list includes all sacred cows, and it feeds under no obligation to be consistent, distributive, or even fair and the harshness of its criticism. It comes from a long tradition in France of satire and political invective that, and that political culture, culture is considered as inherent to democracy as free and fair elections. Indeed, the French Revolution was fought on the back of the defiance of censorship and what they said, truthfully or falsely, about their targets would, not, would make most people blush even today. The pride of polemicists is not that they are nice. 
or that they are fair or consistent, but they have the courage to step from the front, anyone. They hold up a mirror to society and point out the warts, the hairy, beery bellies and all the hypocrisies, large and small, that are an inevitable part of our humanity. They are the needle that deflates pomp and, in doing so, they keep power in check and ensure that people of authority understand that they are being watched at all times. Our society needs this if we are not to alternate between tyrannies of Dom Mintoffs and Joseph Muscats, who are energized by impunity and sheltered by our pathological def deference to demigods in authority. For this to happen, polemical writing must bite. It must necessarily offend. We are all free to ignore it, but we do so at our own peril, as we would if we ignored or even threatened our literal bathroom mirror, when it reminds us of the imperfections we would rather ignore. Does the fact that a polemicist drops swords in our inevit inevitable imperfections require that they themselves are pure before they cast their stones? Not in the real world. Their own imperfections, as inevitable as everybody else's, are irrelevant. It is just not the point. Voltaire's line, that he was prepared to die for the right of people to be able to say things he disagreed with, is not just hollow hyperbole, it is a principle. I learned that lesson in real life from one who taught me much of what I know, Austin Gutt. Many will remember the incident when, as transport minister, he visited university at the end of that summer of the new bus service when people had few reasons to be happy with what they were getting. A student confronted him in front of a crowd and called him a fucking wanker. Most people's instinct might have been to brand her an attention seeker, and she may very well have been. Others would have assumed that she was politically motivated in the partisan sense of that term. As it turned out, she was. But Austin's gut response publicly and privately was that a student, frustrated by unsatisfactory services, faced with the opportunity of confronting a minister anywhere in the democratic world, would have done exactly the same. That's what students should be doing in a democracy, calling ministers fucking wankers, whether they deserve it or not. If students do not do this, they are but another brick in a wall. And as much as a student's behavior ought not to be measured by the motivations of politicians, it is a mistake to make assumptions about Daphne Caruana Galizia's motivations. She has no intention of running for office, so popularity in the affirmative sense of the word holds no interest for her. She does not need to be liked. Hers is a literary form, it is an artistic expression, not a political program. An, artic, an artist expresses her, her art for its intrinsic value as it comes to her and as her skills interpret it and represent it. No artist would be, begrudge applause, but the pursuit of applause is dishonest and a distraction from the inherent purposes of art. People are, being, people are acting surprised because Daphne Caruana Galizia today criticizes people she was full of praise for yesterday. People are acting surprised because she quotes as authorities people she termed lunatic yesterday. That may be odd behavior indeed for a politician or even a journalist acting on the brief of a political party. But people need to realize that Daphne Caruana Galizia lies in the phrase that is often used as a form of insult. She has her own agenda. Of course she does. And consistency is optional and loyalty to any party's program is out of the question. Yes, she chooses to reveal the facts she wants to when she pleases. She criticizes people she disagrees with and holds back from criticizing people she happens to be fine with, switching these categories at will. The problem with our democracy is not that Daphne Caruana Galizia does that, the problem is that she is the only one doing it, that no one else is picking up the stories that do not feature on Daphne Caruana Galizia's agenda on any given Sunday. Speaking for myself, I have no intention of being a polemicist, even if I feel there is a grotesque vacuum that needs filling. There are vacancies for consistent strikers with the national football team as well. 
and I'm not going to fill that vacancy either. <laughs> Neither job is within my aptitude or inclination, but she cannot, she cannot be blamed for being alone. That much, in Voltairean terms, as it were, needs to be said. Our democracy will work better if we expect less deference in our political discourse. We just have to become a lot less touchy than we are. We need to learn as individuals to be critical in our assessment of what we read and grow out of the mental laziness that expects journalists to belong to one or other side of a clean dichotomy which is either Labour or nationalist. We need, to ask, we need to stop asking ourselves whether Daphne is with us or against us. She is neither. Face it. In a world that is not black and white, she is neither wrong all the time and should be banished, nor right all the time and should be idolised. We need to grow up enough to be able to agree and disagree with the same person and to say so without somehow feeling betrayed by them or that we're betraying them. Reading what otherwise sensible people are writing on Facebook about shutting Daphne up, sweeping the blogger away, and other frankly horrific notions, reveals a stunning democratic, democratic immaturity. I do not expect these anti-Daphneites, who were her biggest fans but a season ago, to don balaclavas to shoot Daphne Caruana Galizia like those evil moralizing idiots who killed the Charlie Heblo staff but they sure, are using their, they sure are using their language. If we are to be truly democratic, let us have the courage of our convictions and offer to die for her right to say what we disagree with. Anything less, and there will be one other major hypocritical wart for our only polemicist to gouge. Building a modern, democratic and open European society in Malta, some would call it a liberal, demo, a liberal society. In democratic European societies, political parties do not own, employ or control journalists, TV and radio stations and dailies and weeklies, as political parties do here. Instead, they deliver their message as best they can, while journalists are usually in the employ of organizations who have another different agenda than that of the parties and the politicians, excuse me, and the politicians they cover. Control of the media is one power modern European political parties do not have, nor do they have the power to tell journalists to shut up or to restrain their personal attacks. A petty schoolyard description of pole for polemical journalism, if ever there was one. Having a journalist whose agenda is only her own and not of any political party or even of a commercial conglomerate is a mitigating blessing in the primordial liberal media landscape we still have in this country. Who else is stepping up? On behalf of Manuel, thank you very much. The next speaker, apart from being Manuel's partner in life, is the co-founder of Occupy Justice. My good friend and warrior in arms, Clemence de Jardin. Clemence is a fierce activist, don't we know it? And has an innate intolerance towards injustice. Her instinct to speak up when things are not quite what they should be, is one of the major determining factors that shapes her activism. She is also a loyal friend who has a duty of care towards her fellow activists. The text Clemence will be reading in a moment is a Facebook post she had written on Wednesday, 18th October 2017, at 9.35 p.m. I didn't know Clemence at the time, but her post came up on my Facebook feed because it went viral after some mutual friends had shared it. I wanted to include it in the book because it gives us a glimpse of how the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia, that was meant to silen silence us all, actually made us find our voice. This piece had inspired me and others 
to do something, anything, certainly not nothing. Clemence. The title of the chapter I am about to read is Stand Up to Be Counted. It is mostly about Amélie, our youngest. But before I start reading, it needs to be said that her older brothers, Jérôme and Benoît, have also been there for us and for Amélie, also standing up to be counted. So to the three of them, thank you. For all the wonderful times we have shared, but also for the many times when it has been tense, rough, and very difficult. I am immensely graceful, grateful to be Benoit and Amélie's mother and Jérôme's stepmother. We are blessed to have admirable, intelligent, and generous children. We also acknowledge that whatever <coughs> has been achieved in the last past four years has been possible because you gave us your time and you inspire, inspire us to find the drive and the will to work at making this country a better place and in the process, making Manuel and I better people and better parents. I will now read Stand Up To Be Counted. Tonight, I have witnessed something in our whole household I would have never imagined I would have to face. Our daughter, Amélie, is seven years old, very aware of things, but somehow, as a mother, I never realized the depth of thinking she could reach on her own. She has literally broken my heart and made me realize that if anything, and if for nothing, Manuel has the responsibility of keeping up the fight for freedom and thought of expression. This girl, our girl, at the dinner table, asked Manuel to stop writing. We were sitting with a very close friend, and it was Noel, thank you, Noel, having a sad conversation while, he, while she was trying to express her opinion. When we heard her, of course, we all stopped talking and started listening. I asked her why she felt this way. She looked in our eyes, and through tears and sobs, she said, I don't want daddy to die, the same way Daphne died. I let her cry, and when she was ready, went to try to explain that it is because we don't want anyone to die the way Daphne did, that we need her daddy to keep writing. That we owe it to Daphne. <laughs> that we owe it to Daphne because she paid, uh, <coughs> sorry, she paid for it with her life. We owe it to Daphne's children. We owe it to them, our children, and we owe it to anyone else in the country that we need daddy to keep writing because he needs to say the truth and get people to realize what is right and wrong. Today, I have just faced a new reality, which, uh, which is that a murder, an attempt on democracy, can actually prevent young generation, as young as seven years old, from speaking their mind because <clears throat> they may be scared. They may be scared of peer pressure, they may be scared of being different, but they may also be scared for their own life or the life of their parents. Amélie is strong, empathic, and generous, and has accepted that daddy is doing the right thing. We have reassured her that we will do anything in our power for this to never happen again. But this can only be so if Manuel keeps writing. Manuel, I am so proud of you. I'm still. I know you are doing it because you believe you owe it, not only to Daphne, but also to the country. You need to keep doing it, if anything, for our own children to never be afraid to have a critical opinion, for them to never be afraid to analyze facts, for them to never be afraid to voice their views and contribute to what we hope will be a better Malta for Amélie, Jérôme, and Benoît to live in. It is time to listen to our panel's take on the book, The Third Siege of Malta. This is an impressive lineup of panelists who each, in their own way, are contributing to the conversation in the country. Thank you for investing your time with us this evening. 
So we have Professor George Malia, who's an academic, artist, author, and activist. All the A's. <laughs> Chris Perigine is CEO and founder of Love in Malta. Luizel Vassallo, a dear friend. All are dear friends, but you know. <laughs> is an activist, lecturer, and visual editor. And finally, Dr. George Vital Zamit from the Department of Public Policy at the University of Malta, who will also be moderating the panel. Thank you. OK, good evening. Am I on? All right, OK. So we since we're slightly delayed, and probably some of you are getting hungry, um, uh, we hope we uh, um, enlighten you with this, with this, uh, with this panel. Uh, we shall be uh, perhaps providing a few insights on the book, on the author, on his work. Um, before I start, um, just a few, just a few thoughts that were running in my mind, and I, I decided to write um, this morning. So just, just, just a minute. Um, after I read Murder on the Malt Express. My concern was that this book would be inevitably a duplication. But if the murder was the wound, a national wound, the third siege of Malta is a diagnosis. Through a collection of writings, blogs, columns, using the essay format, Manuel Delia provides not only a refreshing account of how the wound was inflicted, but forays into a sober political analysis of the state, the institutions, political parties, political leaders, our courts, the people. So when you read this book, it's a bit of politics, it's a bit of sociology, it's a bit of anthropology, it's a bit of history. The book is unforgivingly direct. Those who inflicted the laceration, the wound, deserve no second guessing. But it is also prescriptive. A state of anarchy and disorder has weakened the state of Malta. And just as history shows, a weakened state allows the intrusion of other forceful and malign actors, or what some argue, a mafia state. I was with Manuel two years ago on a radio program, and we were contending this. I reluctantly accepted it. Why is this a siege? Now, this is a question which I, which, I, which I formed in my mind when I read the title of the book. Why is this a siege? In the first two sieges, 1565 and 1943, Malta was on the defense. As the author says, brave Malta remained unbowed. A country a nation was under siege. We did not capitulate. Now here is my contention with the title. In the first two sieges, the state was part of the defense. In the third siege, the state is part of the attack. Its pillars of defense are eroded intentionally for people to have no other choice but to bow down. The infiltration of crime has been assisted in no subtle way by the state. So I counted the very, very, the, his subtitle for the blog is Truth Be Told. Is truth, as the saying goes, truly self-sustainable? Can it even stand if it has no public support? In this work, the author labors through and presents us the siege. I would say the nation's siege and his siege and the truth as he sees it. Let us now unpack this work with this panel, look at the author, at his work, at the book, and perhaps ask some questions. We have, okay, it's quarter past eight. So I, I start with you, George. Let's talk a bit about Manuel. What is Manuel? He blogs, he writes columns, a journalist, he's an activist. What is he? You know, I was afraid you were going to say, I'm going to start with you, George. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. It's okay. Okay, but the actual fact is where he's got the right question. Because really, what I would like to talk about, predominantly, more than the book, I read the book, 
I enjoyed reading the book again because, of course, I do follow Manuel's blogs. I do follow his writings in the Times and Sunday Times. But I did read it again because I wanted to see the clusters. I wanted to see the different themes being sort of brought together by Alessandra. Um, I wanted to see whether, you know, in spite of his blogs often digging deep into so many things, whether there was a central plot, if you like, in each of them. And there definitely was. But more than about the book, I think this evening is about Manuel. Manuel is an essential, essential element in Malta today, in much the same way that Daphne was, that the person that he, I won't say he replaced her, because nobody can replace Daphne. Who can? Okay? And he doesn't, at any point in time, try to do that. He stayed so. One of the things I respected the most as I read the book was the incredible sense of honesty. He's admitting that, you know, this was his past life and he did this. And yes, he's sorry he did it, but he did it. And it would be silly for him not to admit that he did it because if he tried to be political and skirt the issue, okay, then of course he would not be credible. And this is what Manuel is. Manuel is credible. And his credibility makes us understand what his mind brings together. One of Daphne's greatest gifts was her ability to join the dots. Was her ability to actually pick out the different strands everywhere and then bring them together in beautiful prose, in a language that made us all understand exactly what's what almost simplifying them for us. And Manuel does the same. He digs deep into what makes corruption tick. He digs deep into, you know, why does the prime minister have three million euros worth of, um, you know, assets when he's 46 years old and has done this work and only gets from there. He's not saying he's doing something wrong, but he asks the questions. He looks at things, we as we look at things, and we'll just let them be. But he asks the questions, and then he digs deep to try to get the answers. And there are times, I mean, I, I loved his style. His style is basically, it, it's very, very, I, I love the way he writes. He writes by posing questions and then answering them. But I think the best questions he asks are the ones that he asks us to answer. What Manuel does is stimulate us to think about the cesspit we're sitting in. He makes us think about, you know, trying to understand where the stink is coming from. Because we all know, but we often try to ignore it. He's making sure that we don't. George, you gave me a cue to, to a question I, I, I intended to ask to, 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 to Chris. Um, because a huge dose of disqualification that Manuel gets, or a rather huge dose of condemnation, is his past activism in politics. So that, for many people, is a disqualifier. That is a non-starter. A priori, you're not credible. And, and, and it's something which, which you mentioned, George, is, 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 is that he renders himself credible. So Chris, my question is, is Manuel loaded by an agenda? regardless of what he's going to write about. So I think um, George says that uh, Manuel is credible. I, I think another word to to describe him, especially in this book, which is basically his, his blog, is authentic. Um, his, uh, I, I think it's clear that Manuel came to a point where he realized that someone's got to do it, you know, and he's well positioned to do it. He knew that um, no matter what he does, he's going to be, he's never going to live down the, the politician side of him, the, the, the Arriva, the, you know, all of the, um, the, the Austin Gartman, you know, these are things that he, he knew he could never um, sort of change and, and make people forget and if there's something to forget. But he also knew that he could, you know, 
be authentically himself and tell the story from his perspective. And it's actually a really good perspective because when you have been involved in politics uh, to the extent that, that he was, you can have a better assessment of the reality of it. I think one thing that's really interesting in this book is his um, sort of grapple, grappling with being a nationalist uh, in, in, the, in the past four years uh, because he you can see that authenticity of someone who who still perhaps has that that sort of blue blood you know but um is looking around and saying uh, do i want it you know do I, am i proud of it today you know am i do i feel um you know that adrian deli is a worthy leader of my party do i feel that bernard grec is do i feel that this party in general sort of makes sense in this in this uh, you know, ex in these extraordinary times, and and I think his pursuit of that truth and 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 that that grappling with it is 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 very authentic, and as, as George said, it is credible, um, and you know we're we're living um, through this time as well, and having his perspective it doesn't mean it's the only perspective. Uh, thankfully. Uh, Manuel isn't the only one, you know, like like Daphne was the only one for for a long time. I, I think uh, the 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 blog post that was read out about Daphne being the only one, and the the fact is that Daphne was was left alone um, in a big way. But since Hamed, uh, I think a, a lot of other people found their voice, and and suddenly um, she's not alone, and and he's not alone. But all of these voices. Uh, add to our greater understanding of of what uh, what's happening around us you know so whether uh, you know he's he's got a loaded past or whatever i think i think it's a great contribution i must say i i i thought i, I read the book yesterday and i read it in in less than 2 hours because obviously a lot of the the stuff i had already read so i could scan scan through it a bit but I, I thought it would be a bit of a lazy put together of blog posts at first, you know, and it's really not. It's it's actually a, a very masterfully put together. Well done, Alessandra, as well. Um, it's it's really it's really well put together because it it's it chronicles the last four years um, in quite a narrative style with little you know paragraphs linking one blog post to the other. Very well chosen blog posts and. Uh, it does turn into uh, quite a gripping read, and I must say a, a hopeful read as well. Um, I think, uh, as you know, uh, everything that the past four years have have been, um, as desperate as it's often felt, I think when you take the time to read what has happened in the past four years from the perspective of of Manuel in this book, we realise how much change has happened as well, and and. That's why it's nice to have that book, you know, because I think online, uh, you know, the day to day, we we often lose sight of all the changes that have happened and all the the work that has had results. You know, all the work of a lot of people over here has has actually uh, bared fruit, and and uh, this sort of puts it together. And when you read it again, you say, actually, these were a, a useful four years as well, you know. That's very true, Chris. As a matter of fact, I think one 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 problem, perhaps, opinion opinion leaders, academics have since 2013 is that so much has happened, so much has happened that people forget that um, there are so many things to write about, um, and I think we are duty bound actually to refresh in people's memories. Luisel, Chris is saying Manuel Delia is not the only one, yet the blogger. It's not a common breed in Malta, correct me if I am wrong. I mean, unless you classify writing a few lines on social media, a tweet or a Facebook post, a blog, I don't think there are many. And Manuel's style is, is almost invariably the essay style. Okay? How do you, how you, how do you decipher this, this, his journalistic style? I mean, how, what, what's your... Well, um... It, yes, he's rare, because very few people are as prolific as Manuel. Daphne was, and Manuel is. I mean, he writes and writes 
and writes, sometimes writes very, very long articles, which in Malta, and unfortunately, people tend to read the headline. They might not read the whole, the whole article, but I hope they do. Um, I, I define Manuel. It's okay. I define Manuel as a journalist, um, true and proper, because for me, journalists shouldn't be people who just write the facts. They have to, of course. They they do. They have that. That's reporting. But I want somebody to give me more. I want somebody to, like Daphne, join the dots to analyze, to go in depth, to, to tell me what they think. I, I understand that not all journalists can be like this, but that's the kind of journalism I look for. And Manuel, and we say this between us, I mean, Manuel's my friend. He wasn't my friend four years ago. He was somebody I knew as an acquaintance, maybe. And it's the call. Maybe we should switch mics. Um, it's the cause that really brought us together, and I am proud to call him my friend. Um, but what we always say is that Manuel brings clarity to everything. Basically, he's a thinker and he's a talker. So, and and it's it's amazing. Sometimes I, I'll be reading the news and seeing a headline and thinking, my God, it's another one, it's another scan. And I'm trying to, to you know, and I'm I'm not stupid, but I I I. I Sometimes some things are very overwhelming, and then you know he just fleets in and he starts talking and to, and and he brings clarity, and that's what I look for in people who write. I mean, Chris, you've written some pretty opinionated pieces, which I am very thankful for because very often in our media in Malta, especially in our broadcast media, forget the partisan content, and I am guilty of that. Like Manuel is with Arriva, I worked at Net Television for many, many, many years. Um, I, I'm not ashamed of it, um, but that's my past. Um, but but in, in most of our media, we don't get that analysis. First of all, we have to decipher who, which agenda people are, are holding. Okay, I mean, but generally it's partisan. And secondly, it's refreshing. This is why everybody used to read Daphne's, Daphne's blogs, and this is why people read Manuel, because he's not, a, in spite of his past, He's not associated to anything but uh, being a free thinker. However, he's unique as well as, as was Daphne, and because he is also a bit isolated. Um, I realize that since Daphne was assassinated, th there have been uh, there's, there's been journalists who have come forward and they've sort of joined forces, which is a good thing. However, he, Aunt Manuel is still isolated. He's not protected by a newsroom. He's not protected by an organization, and every word he writes is a risk he takes on his own. You know? And this is what I would like to see from different newsrooms, um, and we're starting to see it, which is, which is great, is that journalists need to support each other. You know, when, when the country is under siege, because it is under siege, I mean, think about it, every day, every day we read a headline, we read something, and we say, another scandal. It's almost become a cliche. You know, it's it's like we expect to read something like this, and it makes one feel very helpless because the individual is helpless when the, the nation, because Malta is under siege. I know you said the state is, but we are Malta, not you know, the, the, the government and and the ministers who are enjoying themselves and and laughing at us every day. You know, getting away with with things, getting away with murder, literally. So so. This is why I, I, I always do this. I champion journalists and I, I, I urge them to, to work together, to support each other, and to not have, like, Manuel's a blogger, but he's a journalist. Chris runs Loving Walter. He's a journalist. He's written some pretty spectacular pieces. So, so, you know, they need our support, and we have to make sure that we mean it when we say, you know, we left Daphne alone. We don't do it again. We should never do this again, because look at like, where it's brought us. <laughs> a few reminders, some of the few reminders that Manuel actually um, threw in his book. I actually had forgotten this. Uh, page 70. On the day the PN changed the leader, the PL, Partit Laborista, stated the following. 
the faction of Simon Buzutil who supports the arrival of immigrants in Malta has won today's election. Now Manuel Delia has been ostensibly drawn into this faction, day in, day out, news in, news out, radio, media, TV. George, uh, this attempt to discredit a journalist, as systematic as it is, um, what 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 uh, are the implications of it, George? Uh, okay, does this work? It is working now. Okay, okay. Look, we're communications people here, all of us, and we also know that communications is not just a double-edged sword; it's a multi-edged sword. And unfortunately, it is perceptions that define communications, and perceptions are fed. Perceptions are fed by everyone. Okay. One of the things I admire about Manuel is his bluntness. He's blunt. Okay. I'm going to be blunt too. We are living in what is tantamount to a controlled state. We are living in a state where there has been state capture, where all the institutions were taken over in order to protect the few who just wanted to, you know dig their heads into this will and take as much as possible for themselves. And they took it from us. Okay? That's the reality of it. The reality is that. The, okay, you might say, well, look at the polls. Not all of Malta agrees with us. I would imagine that by far the majority disagrees with what I'm just saying. They know it's there. They know it's true. But, you know, who cares? That old famous adage of who cares? Corrupt people will use that in order to portray truthful people as corrupt. Okay? So what we do is, okay, the, the Maltese, we have the expression, Mamun Rai Teksha Bahtek, for example. They will associate somebody like Manuel with Daphne because they had already done the job with Daphne. They had already created the atmosphere needed for people to think she was fair game to kill. They had already built that construction, that bastion around her of words, okay? Calling her names, demonizing her, in order for her to be easy picking by the people who eventually murdered her. And why are we not surprised that those people were linked directly to the state? Of course we're not surprised. It was all one big, you know, I won't say one big agenda, but it definitely had, was part of the agenda of those people who are now no longer in government. The problem is that the people who are now in government act as if nothing happened. Which is why it is so absolutely indispensable that people like Manuel, yes, as Luzel said, as Chris said, it's important that we all point this out together. The cartoonists, you know, scream at the top of their visual voices. The journalists write exactly what they think and feel. Because a journalist is also somebody who states an opinion based on the facts that he or she digs up. They're not just the people who report things. Okay? Those are the reporters. Those are the journeymen, if you like, of journalists. People like Manuel are, I was about to say, the creme de la creme of journalists because what they do is they set the journalistic agenda based on what they see as being the truth. Now, the problem is the title of the book, the title of the blog, actually, the truth. What is truth? What is your truth? Is it the same as my truth? The clarity with which Manuel pushes what he believes to be the truth. But of course, he believes it to be the truth because he bases it on all the, you know, all the facts that are out there and that people prefer to ignore so they can vote another corrupt party into government. Okay? He sees the facts, he points them out, and he builds what he believes is the truth and convinces us that that is the truth. That's a good journalist. That's a good writer. Okay? And that's what we see in Manuel's writing. One thing that, you know, the, the, with Daphne, there was always that thing of, you know, something happening and people would say, what has Daphne said about it? What has Daphne written about it? I'm so happy 
to see that on Facebook, on Twitter, etc., etc., a lot of people share what Manuel writes. And very often, whenever something happens, somebody is going to pop up with one of Manuel's blogs. They don't comment, they just say, read this. And you do, you read it, and you realize, damn, this man is right. Chris, um, as a journalist now, Daphne Caruana Galizia plowed literally into the wrongdoings of powerful people, politics and commercial. But as she did this, she was met with both scorn and admiration. Do you reckon that this is the fate of any journalist that treads this line is inevitable or was her lynching in the literal sense predominantly something that emanates from Maltese culture? Look, I, I think journalists are always going to be um, polemical to some degree, right? Because they're they're pursuing truth. They're they're uh, to some level showing their opinion. You know, Daphne did that um, all the time. A lot of journalists uh, sort of try to hold back from doing that or are held back from doing that a lot. Um, but even then, uh, you know, if you write a story, someone's probably not going to like it, and and they're going to um, see you as as evil or agenda driven or, or whatever. So I think some some level of of that is um, inescapable in journalism. It's 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 part of the the job, and she knew that well. Although she she uh, was so comfortable um, uh, hurting even people that that she that were her friends or whatever you know she was so comfortable calling people out uh, irrespective you know and and and, and that's I, I think uh, uh, something that everyone uh, admires even those who disagree with her you know that kind of courage is um but I think there was something quite unique uh, about Daphne. I mean, first of all, there was the the fact that she mixed some of the best hard-hitting investigative journalism that the country has ever seen with some of the best hard-hitting tabloid journalism and, and gossip that the country has ever seen, you know? And that's a stark um, mix for for people to, to, to accept, you know? It's like... Uh, Th there was that, but I think it's something that Manuel pointed out in in his in his first I think it was the first article right about Daphne, which is that she was such a a fixture in our in our history right. Um, in Malta, we don't really have many veteran journalists. For example, a lot of people leave the job uh, too quickly, probably for the reason that that we just said right the 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 inescapable. Um, you know, uh, anger that that you face on a daily basis from a community that's very small and 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 very close to you. You know, where you could be running in uh, into someone you just wrote about in your gro at your grocer, for example. You know, um, but the fact that Daphne pursued this for so long and almost became a political figure in our in our life, a bigger political figure then you know, prime ministers and, and, and ministers and opposition leaders and, and one who, uh, you know, stood the test of time for much longer than any of these politicians as well, you know. Um, I think that made it quite quite unique. And, and it's, uh, you know, I, I think journalists who do stick it out, who who um, persist and, and like, like Manuel has persisted, you know, for the past four, four years at least, I think that's a, a really great contribution, you know, because uh, we need it, you know, we need to have, even to be able to have that context to, for, the, for the writer themselves to be able to look at a story with the, the benefit of, of hindsight and, and history, etc. And again, that's why I think this, <clears throat> this book is so good as a, as a record, as a chronicle of, of our time. Um, <clears throat> There is, uh, there's a, a my favorite chapter, and this is nothing to do with with politics. Um, it's actually the part where 
Manuel talks about writer's block, and he he wrote this in uh, COVID, like in the COVID, in the worst of the COVID time, I guess. Um, and he's just there, bored at home, looking at a blank screen and wondering what to write, you know. Um, and I really like that because. Again, it was very authentic, you know. It was you're literally just reading the the thoughts of 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 this guy in a very very real way, and it also reminded me of some of the most powerful pieces Daphne used to write on on her blog when they weren't about politics or about uh, the the reality of Maltese culture or whatever, but they were just, you know, uh, I'm cooking this really nice meal, you know, <laughs> and I want you to all, all know about that and, and, and do that yourselves, you know, and um, and I, I really like that. And I think, uh, didn't answer your question, but uh, <laughs> a random reflection about the book. Thank you, Chris. Um, Louis L, not an easy one, but this. Do you want to dedicate a section to France? For me, it felt like Manuel was between a rock and a hard place. The two fronts hit him back with his criticism, which is the Labour Party and the, the, the Parti Nationalista, as it was at the time. And his refuge was the pen. Um, how do you think he has negotiated this animosity towards him? I mean, he, he actually had no, nowhere to go. A man on an island. That's why it's between two fronts. Um, I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't think he's negotiated, to be honest. I mean, I mean, Manuel just writes. I mean, I, I think if he negotiated, he would he would auto censor himself, you know, which he doesn't, thankfully. Um, I, I, did, I. I mean, I admire Manuel because I struggle to write, even though I'm an academic. I, for me, I have to concentrate and I have to be quiet and I have to, you know, reread and reread and rewrite. And, and he just churns things out, so I'm a bit jealous of that. Um, but I don't think he negotiates. If, if there's one thing I've learned about Manuel, um, you know, getting to know him over these years, is that Manuel listens, okay? Manuel is not. The, the person that maybe his enemies would like others to think he is, the way they depict him and, you know, that he's some arrogant person. He really isn't. He's a feminist, which, because he champions women. Um, it's true, it's true. I mean, just read what he writes about um, Occupy Justice, about Daphne, about, but not just, it's not just lip service, he, he is. Um, and, and he listens and he, he consults. Uh, so, so he thinks about things, but but he doesn't. I don't think he compromises. Let's put it this way. And I think he's very aware of the fact that once you decide in Malta, we're just polarized. So once you decide to not be affiliated to either one side or the other, you're under attack from all angles. And even if you speak the most obvious truth, even if you do that you still get attacked because people, critical thinking hasn't landed in this island. I mean, I, I don't say it in a, in a nasty way, but it hasn't. People are fed certain things and they are, you know, they're, 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 there's no, I'm not saying that there are people that, and people have different um, um, priorities maybe. I don't expect everyone to be constantly, you know, on, onto the news. People have families, people have kids, but, what we are fed predominantly, unfortunately, especially when they attack journalists, you know, is, is what they get. And if you're not getting any other information, it, unfortunately, if this is allowed to happen, I said this recently, we don't have a media authority to, to control or, or regulate, let's say, not control our media. We have a broadcasting authority, but broadcasting is only you know, radio and TV, and now they're trying to regulate online through the Broadcasting Authority, but it doesn't work that way. So we don't have an independent media authority to regulate all media houses, and we still haven't even started to understand the implications of, of social media and what it's, the, the implications it's, and, and, and the repercussions it's having on us. So, so to go back to your question, I think Manuel is very aware of all this. And I don't think he negotiates or compromises and just gets on with the job. No. 
thank you. George, at a point, at a point, Daphne Caruana Galizia became an enemy of the state. And to counter that, a blog was created by someone who worked at the office of the Prime Minister on a full-time salary, working in the morning, uploading pages, with the sole aim of creating a balance. This, this, this is what the argument was, the balance. So it seems that, or this is how I read it, because Mrs. Caruana Galizia had a readership which was extensive on a daily basis, then it was fair game to destroy her. Haven't we yet, because Louiselle mentioned critical thinking. Now, I, I, I cannot gauge whether we are a country of critical thinkers or not. I don't know. Okay, let's, let's, let me refrain from making that assessment. But it seems we have a hard time grappling with the idea that we need to hold people in power accountable. George. George, we are sheep. We are followers. We are not leaders. We do. We have a few leaders amongst ourselves. Manuel is one of them, of course. But we we have a lot of. Sh unfortunately, I'm I'm sorry. I'm using this word. I hate using it because it's a cliche. But the point is this. Okay. I'm, let Let me just. Uh, your boss, Andrew. Okay, the dean of the faculty. He has a program on on one o three, and he got Manuel on apparently uh, a week ago or something. I read Andrew posting that he and that Manuel was going to be his guest on the program. The bile that resulted from that was out of this world. The litany of repetitions of the same thing in different words by different people. Let's call them different people. I'm sure many of them, you know, were the same person and under different personas. The enormous trolling that has become a professional, a profession in Malta, literally, okay? Paid profession, by the way, okay? In some cases, where we actually have leaders who feed the trolls what to say so that there is a common front which attacks, okay? Anybody who in some way impinges on the agenda of the authorities. It's enormous, it's amazing. This is the reality. Critical thinking, what the hell is that? It doesn't exist. What is critical thinking? Critical thinking is, but I can't do critical thinking because the person who feeds me what to say didn't allow me to do that. Obviously. Which is where civil society comes in. I think of Manuel as being the author that communicates in written words what civil society stands for in Malta today. Okay? In much the same way that Republica showed the way with the protests, not just, but the protests, okay? In much the same way that, you know, Occupy Justice have shown the way with their explosions of visual protest, okay? Manuel is literally mapping civil society stand in today's society with his blog. That's what we have there. Chris called it the chronicle of today's... So it's not actually a chronicle of today's life, Chris. It's a chronicle of one side of it. It's a chronicle of the, you know, the, 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 the people who are the actual opposition in this country. Civil society, Republica, Occupy Justice, and all the people who followed them in order to bring down Joseph Muscat's government. That's what this was. This was what that's what about. If you were to read Manuel's blogs, I, you would have said you liked those bits, the bits where, which were not political. I have to admit I like the political bits a lot more, but that's okay. All right? I like the bit where he narrates his visit to prison, for example. I like the bits where he talks about the incident at the monument where an old man fell to the floor to the ground and of course they spun it for it to be something else but it wasn't because he wasn't writing about the incident he was writing about the society that made that poor old man go up and try to attack the people who were putting flowers in front of Daphne's memorial he was looking at the humanity 
that has been mobilized, if you like, because of what a few people up there, okay, captured. They captured our states. They captured us. And in, in order to do that, the cogs in the wheels that they needed to oil were the common herd who, unfortunately, follow them blindly. So, George, what we are in this society right now is we have the intelligent thinkers like Manuel. Okay? We had the Daphne. We keep on mentioning Daphne. I'm trying not to because this is about Manuel more than Daphne. And he does say that it's not his plan to continue where she left off, but he is doing it in any case. Okay? This is about Malta today. This is about people who think like Manuel does. People who think, hopefully, like a lot of you who are here today. Because you're here because of that. Because you do think. Okay? Because you're not following the herd, if you like, that goes one way or the other. You are individual thinkers. And because of that, you follow what Manuel writes. Okay? And then we have the people who are led by the nose, by those with agendas that have nothing to do with the well-being of multi-society. They are the true enemies of the people. And it's very important that truth be told about them. And Manuel just does just that. <clears throat> Chris, Chris, in the, in the epilogue, there is a line that, when you read it, it's sort of, it's shocking because there's a sudden realization that it dawns on you that things are connected. I read verbatim. The corruption that killed Daphne Caruana Galizia is a cousin of the corruption that killed Miriam Patch. The moral danger Daphne Caruana Galizia lived in and died under is not unrelated to the danger of Lassana Casse or Sasse. Unquote. Is this a stretch too far? I mean, is, is Manuel here stretching it too far? Or is there a connection between? These are three different cases happening in three different contexts. Is there, is there a common line? Is there a common denominator that connects these cases? And obviously there are more. Yeah, I think, I think there is a common line and, and it's a bit related to what Louisel and George were saying even about critical thinking, which I must say, I, I, a part of me wants, at least wants to disagree with them on, um, in the sense that um, maybe... I, I both of them. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but I, I think one of the common themes is that Malta is post-colonial, right? And for us, it's been a bit difficult to transition from being sort of ruled by uh, an empire to sort of ruling ourselves and not falling into the same um, patterns of looking at power as, as being so, and, and authority as being servile to it, wanting to suck up to it, wanting to be, be uh, you know, given things by it, you know, as if it's not our right, as if, you know, if we, if we are, are, are nice or, or we give in, you know, then, then we will get more out of the state, you know, which needs to... So I, I see a lot of um, post-colonialism in, in, in Malta, and I think it's resulted in the way we've sort of built this this duopoly, right, this, this bipartisan uh, system and become very servile to these to these parties and that's re partly reduced our ability to to think critically but we've also built structures to make sure we cannot think critically right as in we we literally have you know tv stations owned by the political parties to do the very opposite of teach critical thinking right um and and so I don't think it's a surprise that over time, especially over the last thirty years, our planning system, for example, has has come to the state that it's in. I think that's a result of this part post colonialism and the the building of, of institutions to entrench it. Um so so even when one of us dies in a building collapse, um we're 
we're not sure how to deal with it. We wait to see what the party says. We we're told, ah, okay, the local plans, ah, okay, blame the national. All right, we'll move on. You know, as in, we we don't have. Um, there isn't enough sort of sp to uh, talking to, to, to power in that sense and, and critical thinking, yes. Um, I, I think where I sort of disagree, so to speak, is that I'm a bit more hopeful about it. Uh, maybe it's uh, by virtue of being a little bit younger and, and more naive. But I, I think that, uh, I think Malta is changing in this respect. And I don't think we're just a bunch of sheep. I think we're people who don't really have good leadership to follow, right? And we're not taking on that, that leadership as well. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if that answers your, your question or... That's, that's, that, that's fine. Um, uh, Chris, I, I have a few more minutes left and I have the last three questions. Um, uh, Louis L, I'm going to cite a fact, then I'll leave it to you to interpret it whichever way you like. According to Reporters Without Borders, in 2021, we rank 81st in the World Press Freedom Index. We rank 81st. I leave it to you. Of course we do. First of all, um, I, 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 I work on the Media Pluralism Report, and we have a massive problem in Malta, not just with political parties owning TV stations. We have a problem with the control on the state TV station, the fact that it depends entirely on the state, even though it's there to serve the public, um, our proximity, our sound, obviously um, the fact that a journalist was murdered in our country has a big effect. The fact that journalists get threatened, the fact that Manuel writes a blog post and gets a phone call from a private number and this person threatens him and threatens his family. That's the country we live in, because people are not aware of these things. I mean, okay, Manuel wrote about it, but journalists get threatened. Journalists, um, you know, they, they have to be careful, because let's face it, journalists don't write good news. They're going to step on someone's toes when they write something. So that someone, if it happens to be a powerful person, connected to politics, I mean, it, it's a scary place, you know? and. What worries me is that sometimes, and I'm not saying they do this, but I don't blame them if they do, journalists can auto-censor themselves. Because, you know, they have young children, because they have a family, because they don't want to be driving home and looking under their car to see, you know. And this is the country we live in. And sometimes the retribution is not necessarily physical, as in violent. It can be... Um, the dehumanization of a person, the attacks. Um, George mentioned the, the trolling. It, it's just so obviously orchestrated and it's tiring. Um, because when you're alone or when you're an individual and you're trying to do your job and suddenly you're, on, you're online and you, like, like you mentioned, Andrew posted, but it happened to Andrew this week as well, Andrew Atapardi. He wrote a piece about uh, reforms that he would like to see in, in prison. And he got trolled, you know, till, till his voice couldn't be heard. Because if there are 100 people commenting, it's not a lot of people, 100 is nothing on Facebook. But if 100 people are commenting negatively and calling you names and, and you know, dehumanizing you and not even trying to have a discussion with you, just calling you names, it's exhausting. And how long can you do this for? My friend, Anna Marco, does it very... You know, she defends our Occupy Justice page daily on her own. I don't know how she does it, because I would just, I would just like block people <laughs> who are evidently <laughs> fake profiles. But this is what journalists face, all of them. I think every journalist in Malta has to, you know, when they find something out, for, for us as activists, the job is much easier. And I say this because I don't think we do anything extraordinary in the sense we're so angry, we can't help it. I mean, we have to do something, because otherwise we'll explode. But the, the thing is, journalists have a responsibility. They know information. And when they find, I, it must be a very scary place to be in. When somebody gives you information, and you have to make that decision whether to publish it or not. So, so Malta deserves to rank there. Because, because I've met so many, and journalists in Malta have really stepped up. A lot of them, or, or a number of them, have stepped up. 
And it's great to see the IGM has stepped up in the past year, you know, which is something we hadn't seen in a long time. So, so part of me is hopeful because I'm seeing good work. But it's not a, an easy place to work in. And we're small, we all know each other, everybody gets offended, you know, and then and worse than that. So, so yes, we deserve that position. And I'm not saying it as a traitor, for those of you watching online and thinking she's a traitor of Malta. I love my country, you know. I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm telling you this is the way it is. And the better, the sooner we fix it, the better it will be. <coughs> Chris, one last question for you. One, one illustration, which is the last one in the book, that really struck me is fearless. The story of Daphne Caruana Galizia. I, I've, apologies, I forgot the author of the... Okay. So, Daphne is on a tree with a bird's eye view. And I, I found this very symbolic because she is there alone and 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 the solitude is is conspicuous. I think it's inescapable. Is this the fate, Chris, that every journalist, investigative journalist, I qualify, has to endure um, uh, with investigative um, writing? Is 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 it inescapable? I mean, you have to end alone. up alone. Well, I, I don't think so, as in, uh, and, and I don't operate in an environment where I'm alone, right? So, so uh, we have a newsroom and there are newsrooms and, and, and I, I think that's quite a, uh, it's a good thing to have that, right? Because you have a much wider support network, you're, you're, you can even challenge your own ideas e more easily, you know, and have other people... Um, edit your work and things like that. So I think it's not inevitable as, as journalists to be alone. And I think journalists also have a community, even if, when they don't sort of stick up for each other um, or when they criticize each other as well, which is also part of, of journalism and, and free journalism. Um, I don't think it's inevitable to, to be alone, but I do think that the, the more brazen you are, um, the easier it is to end up quite alone, you know, because to do the job with the with the you know vigor and 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 being being ready to to keep um, like I said to call out even those closest to you if you need to call them out, then then your your circle does get smaller, and it's a bit like a judge's circle has to get smaller to be able to to take certain decisions you know so so i think that's um relevant um but i but i think this uh, i think daphne's story i think what what really uh, hits home even even when i read this book you know it's 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 so incredible the last lines she wrote right that the situation that there are crooks everywhere and the situation is desperate i mean uh, it's it's startling how 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 perfect the, the, those last lines were, um, but I must say I, I I think these past four years and even looking around me today and I I really feel that um, things are changing in in this country and and when when I look around I I don't only see crooks everywhere you know I see a lot of good people everywhere and a lot of honest people and a lot of people who are fighting for for good you know a lot of the occupy justice people of the Re republica people a lot of people on all sides of the the political spectrum and in journalism you mentioned igm as well you know and i i think the situation is starting to look a bit more more hopeful in that in that sense um and if it does keep going in that direction then journalists won't be so alone and it won't be so inevitable for them to to be on their own you know I, i've seen a greater appreciation of journalists work in the past four years um than i had seen there's also obviously the trolling that you you see the other side as well right and and that's also become harsher um but it all it, but it increasingly looks inauthentic it looks manufactured and when you see that it's so manufactured, even though it's still very dangerous, in a, in a sense, you know, it, it looks like it could be overcome uh, a bit more. So 
yeah, I think the the the, the images throughout the book, first of all, are are great, you know, because they really um, help bring a lot of the, the the text to life. I think that image of uh, a journalist on a on a tree, sort of being fearless. I mean, fearless really is the best word to describe you know the best journalists like Daphne uh, including like like Manuel you know I think fearless is a is a very good description of of that um and I think my kind of parting parting shot so to speak is that um a lot more people are are fearless today whereas there was a time when like we said we, we left people like Daphne alone um I think there's been a lot of sort of coming out of the Daphne closet, you know, in, in these past four years. And and that's um, meant something, you know, it's created something that is uh, bigger than, than, than one individual person. George, in, uh, in the State of the Nation survey that has just been published last week, the Maltese people ranked from highest to lowest. First, justice, freedom, equality, solidarity, in that order. Do you think that the third siege brings to the fore this finding, confirms it, or contradicts it? Yes, it prefers you. There you are. All right. First of all, I mean, I love Chris's young hopefulness. Um, I am old, so I can be less hopeful. I think we can say that. George, your question is, I mean, more than anything else, it's the fact that solidarity is at the very, very bottom of the pile that worries me the most. This is the island of St. Paul. <laughs> this is the island that was known for its you know, love of people, of, you know, people opening their doors to other people. What the hell happened to us? This is no longer us. This is... Well, I, I don't know. It could have been, I don't know. I don't know. I think it was some one of the evangelists, wasn't it? But okay, we'll leave it at that. I don't know. Who, maybe he voted Joe Muscat at that point. Who knows? I don't, but the argument is very simple. It's the fact that Solidarity is no longer at the core of it. And this is the point I would like to make. You know what the saddest blog was that is in the book? And I really felt it, really felt it deeply, Manuel. It's where you admitted how sorry you were that th being threatened by a slap lawsuit, you actually retreated and retracted a, a bit of writing that you did about the bank, about the, okay? And, and for me, that was the saddest bit of all. Why? Because this journalist, this brave man, this fearless man, was afraid. And that makes you human. And you are. And we all are. And that's why it is so easy for us to be cowed into submission by people with power. And that's why I'm so happy that in 99% of the times, you were not cowed into submission, in spite of there being that incredible lack of solidarity that came last in rank when it came to the characteristics of the Maltese people. What I can say is this. What we need to do is push up that solidarity in the same way that civil society spit in the face of authority and told them, we are no longer part of a political system that elects a government every four years, or in the case of the Labour Party, every three and a half years, or something like that, okay? Um, and, and that's it, that's what democracy is in Malta. We stand for what we believe in. You stand for what you believe in. What we need to do, all of us, okay, here I'm pre preaching to the converted, I suppose, because you are all part of this. But what, what we should do is this, we should emulate you. Everybody with his or her talent, with his or her ability, with his or her critical thinking, yes, they do, it does exist. Of course, it does exist, okay? Each of us needs to be out there and not be cowed into submission, not be made to retract what we believe in, in the same way that you were made, were literally browbeaten into 
retracting something you believed in strongly and felt sorry for it afterwards. We need to show solidarity with people like Manuel by being out there, by actually saying what we mean in our own way, by thinking out loud, by actually stating out loud when we think that the authorities suck. Okay? That's what we should do. And thank you, Manuel, for showing us the way. And with that act of defiance, I would say um, uh, we bring, yes, we wrap up this panel. Thank you, the organizing committee, for inviting us. Thank you, Chris Peregin, George Malia, Luis El Vassallo. Thank you very much. Uh, you're walking away with 135,000 words I wrote, so the last thing you need is a speech. So just a few words of thanks from me. First, thanks for everyone helping out tonight and for the panelists who took the time out and managed to do something that doesn't often happen in my experience, find nice things to say about me. Uh, um, for, <laughs> I, I wrote this this morning, so I was optimistic. For <laughs> the blog, I thank my donors, subscribers, contributors, commenters, guest writers, and translators. Actually, it's one translator who takes time out almost every day to translate many of my articles uh, to Maltese. I'm not supposed to call out their name, but they can hear my thanks anyway. And of course, I thank the blog's readers and visitors who are the point of it all. Truth must be told, but there is little point if it isn't also read. For my column, I thank my editors at the Sunday Times, Mark, Anthony, and Herman. Thank you for the space and the opportunity. I'm told the first time I don't feel excited I'm on the Sunday Times next Sunday is when I should quit writing. My next column is almost done. For the book, I thank Alessandra and her eidetic memory with the genius. This book would either be longer than the family edition of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire or not exist at all were it not for her. I thank Martin Bugelli for ringing out most of the typos and adopting the logical orphans. I thank the cartoonists and illustrators who have enriched this book with their art, their humor, and their insight. Thank you, Celia, Sebastian, Pepito, George, Miriam, Steve, Marisa, and Gataldo. You've made this a better book. A special mention for Rebecca Zamit Lupi, whose art is also a part of this book. May you may you be reminded of her beautiful but all too brief life whenever you see again this book on your shelves. I thank Joe Mitzi for once again being my courageous publisher. I mean courageous as Humphrey Appleby would use it when he meant to discourage his minister. <laughs> but nothing discourages Joseph Mitzi, not even the legal letters and the threatening phone calls. Which takes me to my next set of thanks. For blog, column, books, and all my other adventures, I thank my lawyers. <laughs> Eve, Therese, Jason, Paul, Matthew, Carol, Michael, Antonio, Simon, and every day, out of nothing but friendship, but with much too much patience and generosity added on top, Andrew Borch Cardona, Al Bocha himself. <laughs> Bocha is the only reason most of the threats for libel I'm faced with remain just threats. If you're in my business, make sure your best friend is a good libel lawyer. Thanks go to my colleagues at Republica, all other activists in Occupy Justice, the Daphne Foundation, and other groupings and organizations who continue to resist this siege. Every day, I strive to be worthy to fight alongside them. Thank you to colleagues in Maltese news organizations who eke out the truth like water out of the stubborn and secret rock that is our government. I write my commentary largely on facts established by others. On their shoulders, I stand. And I'm told that can be unpleasant for someone beneath me. <laughs> they can never be named, but they must be thanked. 
sources, whistleblowers, people of conscience, who help journalists and who help me understand what is really going on. Before it's told, truth is learned from its witnesses who overcome fear and gamble with risk for no reward, but a sense that they have served justice. Thank you to Daphne Caruana Galizia for her example, her sacrifice, her heroic presence even now. There is no risk this will sound like Oscar's night, what with ponies roaming freely and chickens and the rest, but big, and big old glamorous me giving you this final good night. But please indulge my final thanks to my wife Clemence and our children Benoit, Jerome and Amelie, to whom this book is dedicated. For your patience, thank you.